think we'll get going. And uh, the topic of this um, evening's discussion is the poster malilis. And uh, the question that we propose to you is why should you uh, repair or perform open reduction internal fixation on the poster malilis uh, on a fracture, for example, such as this? Um, is there any utility in repairing the poster malilis to uh, provide stability? Uh, this is uh, this is us. Uh, this is us for the evening. This is Dr. Matt Camuso, Dr. David Stevens, and myself. Um, and we will um, guide you through uh, our discussion. These are our disclaimers. Um, we have no significant financial relationships. Our Dr. Camuso doesn't have any pertinent uh, relationships associated with this webinar this evening. Uh, AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty so society dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injury. We do not endorse nor promote the use of any product, service, or commercial entity. A little bit about Zoom etiquette. If you have questions that you'd like to ask us, uh, we, we request that you utilize the Q&A box, which is in the ribbon uh, on your Zoom uh, software panel. Um, and we'll hopefully get to your questions uh, in, in due time. Um, and all the microphones have been muted and the cameras have been turned off. So these are our learning objectives for the evening. Uh, we'd like for you to appreciate the osseoligamentous anatomy of the posterior ankle. We'd like for you to recognize that there is a relationship, a strong relationship between the posterior malleolus and syndesmotic stability. We'd like for you to identify surgical approaches to provide direct reduction of the posterior malleolus and identify that the posterior malleolus anatomic fixation results in an improved functional outcome for your patients. We're not going to be talking about syndesmotic fixation this evening. That in and of itself can be its own webinar. Um, so um, we're not going to delve too deep in terms of uh, construct types or um, dynamic versus static fixation. But we are gonna sit around our virtual fireplace this evening and go over some cases. So grab your virtual cocoa and uh, here we go. So here's a 21 year old person who uh, was tackled in football just to wet your whistle about uh, what we're gonna be talking about this evening. Uh, we have this fracture involving the um, Lateral malleolus, we have uh, lateral translation of the talus, uh, looks like overt um, increased clear space widening of the tip fibs clear space, and then a posterior malleolus fracture. And we'll get into more detail about uh, the strategies of fixing these, but this is kind of the, the overview of what was done for this patient, which is fixation of the lateral malleolus in an anatomic manner, restoring the length and alignment of the lateral malleolus, and then fixation in an anti-glide method through a posterior approach for the posterior malleolus. And what is conspicuously absent here is, this, is any type of transyndesmotic fixation. And that even with stress examinations of the syndesmosis, the ankle is stable. So, you know, when I was a junior resident, I learned one of the first things I learned in orthopedics was that if you have a super syndesmotic fracture, then you're gonna have to put in syndesmotic fixation and, you're, and if you don't, you're not going to have a stable ankle. So what happened here? What We, we had a super syndesmotic fracture, and we were still able to render stable fixation and uh, not need syndesmotic fixation. So I think to begin, um, I'll just give you a quick overview of the posterior osseoligamentous anatomy. And what you really want to uh, put your eye to is, is the posterior tib tibiofibular ligament and the transverse inferior tibiofibular ligament. These are these two posteriorly based fascicles that bind the tibia or the posterior lateral aspect of the tibia to that of the fibula. And there have been anatomical studies looking at the actual anatomy of these ligaments. And one of the striking things that I wish to impress upon you is, is that this posterior structure that is attached to the posterior malleolus is actually a very broad fan-shaped structure that attaches from the posterior lateral fibula to the posterior lateral aspect of the uh, tibia, but also extends all the way posterior medially. We know that if we restore the posterior malleolus, that you're gonna improve the syndesmotic stability by retentioning these posterior structures more appropriately. And this has been shown by Gardner and Lorch that fixation of the posterior malleolus will not only improve stability, but it will also improve the articular congruity, both of the posterior malleolus and the incisura itself. So here we go. Let's go through the first case. It's a 28-year-old man who fell, presented two weeks after his injury. He had a pretty benign examination, and he had no significant findings uh, from a clinical examination. 
So I guess uh, we'll start off with uh, Dr. Camuso. I mean, when you look at these x-rays, I mean, what, 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 what kind of take us through your thought process? What do you think when you see an x-ray like this? Thanks, Brad. Um, you know, when I look at any ankle, first of all, I love fixing ankles because they're all a little bit different. And the first thing I try to do is sort of in my mind's eye, think about how the injury happened, how the ankle failed. Um, and I do that by looking at all of the different parts of the ankle. And so as I look at this injury, I see that there's a fibula fracture that's sort of inconspicuous on the anterior posterior view, but is clearly seen um, supersyndesmotic, you know, on the lateral view. Um, I see on the lateral view a displaced posterior fracture that back in the day we might call that, oh, that looks like it might be 10%. And we could talk about that. And we probably should talk about that because that was a percentage that was really important back when I was training. Um, you know, it meant that if it was 10%, didn't need to do anything about it. But that it looks like a posterior fracture that's not enormous. Um, and, and, and I guess the other thing that I see um, on the anterior posterior view is just sort of a, an irregularity at the medium malleolus, not just near the anterior colliculus, um, but also sort of um, near the medial distal tibial metaphysis. Um, and that for me is a little bit of a red flag sometimes. What, what, are, you, what are you concerned when you see that little um, radiographic finding? Yeah, it suggests to me that um, that posterior malleolus that I think, you know, what I expect typically is just a single posterior malleolar fracture that's posterior lateral in position, that it may actually extend more medially. And that that is a reflection of that medial extension is that irregularity on the border. I don't know for sure, Brad, but that is something that I would be thinking about. And for me, would prompt me to order some advanced imaging to understand the back of this ankle fracture a bit better. Okay. Uh, David, is that typical for you? Are you frequently getting advanced imaging on all of your ankle fractures? Are there certain people that don't get advanced imaging? Pretty much every ankle for me at least gets a CT now, unless it's a real isolated lateral malleolus that, you know, you can barely see on x-ray. As soon as I start to see, and, and especially the displacement, you know, the injury films really kind of illustrate the the displacement and the severity of the injury. So that also points me in the direction of a CT scan uh, for sure. And so um, pretty much routinely. And then the other thing, the other caveat is often X is CTing both ankles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if in that first case you showed, obviously there's a syndesmosis injury, but sometimes it can be pretty subtle. We all know that there's different morphology of the insensura. So when you're trying to figure out whether that's uh, insensura or the syndesmosis is wide or rotated, often a, a contralateral CT, they're going to be in that gantry anyway. And so why not get both of them for comparison? So I have a real low threshold to get a CT. You can see on the lateral, there may be some impaction there in that small posterior peripheral uh, posterior malleolus as well. And so the CT, like other places, like the hip joint and then other joints, really characterizes some of the impaction or the articular involvement that may happen. So um, in this particular instance, uh, we um, did get the CT scan. The slide is, uh, just reiterates that one cannot really assess the morphology of the posterior malleolar lesion through plain radiographs alone because uh, there can be just additional complexities that just you can't tell with a lateral radiograph. And so that's the CT scan for this patient. So, um, so Matt... Um, what do, you, what do you think? Is this typical? Is this is what we normally see when we get CAT scans of trimalleolar ankle fractures. Nailed that, huh? Matt. Matt nailed that uh, posterior medial involvement. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I mean, fortunately, it's not uh, all that typical. But it, when it happens, you have to address it, right? So, um, I, I mean, back, I don't know, even just ten years ago, Brad, I might have looked at that um, set of X-rays and said, "Oh, it's just a posterior lateral malleolus. I'll fix it if the syndesmosis is unstable after I fix the medial and lateral side." but I would not have had a good understanding of this large medial fragment and certainly not appreciated where the impaction is um, on, in this case. And so, um, you know, I, I think that this is why we get them, right, is, is to not only understand the morphology uh, of the fracture, it's to help us plan if we're going to fix it and to help us reduce those articular impaction injuries when they're reducible and when they're not, 
removing them so that they don't impede uh, the reduction of the remainder of the post stimuli list that we intend to perform. So, Dave, when you see this CT scan, how does this guide your surgical planning? Well, I, uh, you know, obviously Mass, Matt alluded to a posterolateral approach, but here it extends right over the medial side. And we know from anatomic studies, a paper out of Ottawa, that it, the posterolateral really limits your view right across. And, and so the impaction's medial for me. And I'm, for me, for a posterolateral approach, whether I do that lateral, or even prone, it's going to be really tough to see that uh, medial impaction or free fragment, whichever it is. Uh, I think it's probably a combination of both, right? And so for me, this is one that now uh, a posterior medial approach would be useful uh, to gain access to that impaction that I'm not going to see from a posterior lateral side. And, uh, and also, you know, there's some evidence for sure that you go after that posterior lateral and then you try, you put that back and you try and fix it, uh, the posterior medial fragment, you're going to get either uh, an imperfect reduction, or it's going to actually displace it as you push that posterior lateral fragment more medial. Mm. That's a very good point. We have a we have a, a diagram we wish to show everyone in a few moments. Um, before we go on, Dave, just um, how how do you access that fragment? Like you know, in like a plateau, for example, sometimes you can make like a cortical window and tamp it down through a tamp in the intermedullary space, and but. And then other times you can open the fracture and actually look at the articular fragments. In that in this particular uh, fracture, what, what would you do? This would be a, a prone approach for me, uh, be a combined, uh, when I say posterior lateral, I mean off the posterior corner, if you will, or the posterior ridge of the lateral malleolus. So not a true posterior lateral that we would do, but it's more of a lateral approach, posterior lateral approach to the fibula. And then a posterior medial approach here, and I, you know, this kind of exits on the postromedial border, but I think you need access more centrally. So this is the, the true postromedial approach where you're working just a little anterior to the tendo Achilles and you're working through the FHL uh, muscle belly and either working between FHL and the tendo Achilles or, and, or between FHL and the nerve bundle. And then you're, you're figuring out a strategy that you're going to gain access to the joint. So you're probably working through that fracture and booking it open much like you do a plateau or at least sometimes you do and getting access to the joint and if the fragment's big enough then you can temporize or you can use whatever you know absorbable pins if you have it and then um, close the book down as you would in a plateau or you just excise it and the other thing it gives you access to the joint your talus is going to be there so you can appreciate any uh, chondral lesions of the talus and you can wash out the joint as well. Okay, thank you. Dave, can you judge the articular reduction directly in this, or are you doing it some other way? I think it's a combination. I, I think you, you it's a probably yeah. a couple of things, right? It's obviously you can't really see it very well with radiographs. That's more for your your actual cortical fragments. Uh, you can use the talus as a template. So we do that, you know, when you have impaction in the posterior wall, the acetabulum, you kind of elevate it and then you use the femoral head as a template and then you distract and see how it looks. And, you know, that may take uh, a number of iterations before you get it to your satisfaction. Sometimes you can see it on the seat on the uh, interoperative imaging. Um, and I guess if you're lucky enough to have an interoperative CT scan, you can do that as well, like a, uh, like we do for other joints. So I think it's a combination of several things. How about you? Brett, yeah, Brad, and this one, and Dave, this one is one where, um, you know, I understand that it's difficult to see, you know, the joint, it's not kind of, it's not like looking at the ankle from the front, right? Because of the overhang of the post this is more difficult to see. But I think sometimes you still can um, get in to see it. And I always have a miniature distractor around to be able to distract and look inside that joint. Um, to just, if anything else, just feel what the reduction feels like. Um, having that tool for me is a real um, game changer when it comes to being able to um, judge the articular reduction here. Certainly, you know, I do rely on radiographs to some degree, but I, I try to at least palpate it as well, if not see it, if, um, if I can using the distractor. We have a question on how you set up the CR. So the conversation is... Uh... <clears throat> 
There's a question on how you set the CRM up, up for this. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, I was going to get to like patient positioning and approach, and we we're already well on our way to talk about these things. Uh, uh, with regard to patient positioning, it all depends upon, at least for me, whether or not you attempt to do all the surgery from one position, or if you just plan on doing all the approach through a poster approach in a prone position and flipping the patient. For me, I, I usually use two positions. I, I usually start posteriorly and do the posterior work and uh, place the patient prone, uh, bumped on uh, asymmetrically placed gel rolls. So it kind of, it's like a bump, except it's underneath the anterior superior iliac spine so that you get a really nice, easy to obtain lateral radiograph from just basically bringing the C-arm uh, up to the lateral horizontal position. And, and that imaging looks very, it works very, very well for me. You can actually use C-arm to insert screws. I usually have the monitor at the head of the bed. So that way I don't have to turn my head while I'm putting in screws and, and sizing things and the like. How about you, Dave? No, that, I, I agree. Um, for sure. I think yeah. some, sometimes it's a little hard when we're prone. Um, uh, if you don't have the the limb perfectly horizontal, um, when you get an AP view on your C arm, or in this case a PA view, I guess, um, and the and the ankle is tilted, or the leg the leg is um, uh, tilted because um, of how you position the patient. Um, you're not getting an orthogonal view of the ankle, and so you have to remember to cant the beam so that you're looking at a true AP in the ankle. It's analogous to imaging a distal femur when you're trying to do a retrograde nail, right? It's on a triangle and you can't just get a straight up and down view because the leg is on a triangle. Um, the same thing is true of the ankle so that you don't get sort of lost by looking at an obliquogram on the AP view. Yeah, as, as counterpoint, Matt, the way that I uh, deal with that issue is I actually just position the patient's torso and their abdomen, uh, pelvis, like tipped. So like I take, uh, I take two gel rolls and then the contralateral side that's being operated on, I build up with blankets and then I put the gel roll on top of it. And that puts obliquity in the pelvis. And then, so when the patient's leg is positioned, it's, it's like it purely anatomically aligned. So essentially it's horizontal with the floor. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to rotate the leg. And of course, the more, more external rotation contraction the patient has, the more you have to bump. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the approaches uh, that we uh, were talking about, the posterolateral and postromedial approach. Um, and, and there are d various nuances to these approaches. Um, um, but essentially, it's, it's uh, through FHL or through the FHL uh, fascia and belly and then right to the posterolateral aspect of the uh, uh, postromedialis or conversely near posterior tib and the neurovascular bundle on the medial side. Um, it, it, you can utilize a myriad of different approaches provided that you understand the anatomy. You can go essentially anywhere you want to go. So uh, this is that um, X-ray again. Again, the, 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 the CT scan does not uh, represent the, the, excuse me, the X-rays don't represent the CT scan true morphology that well. Uh, and this is the approach through a lateral approach that we talked about. And this is uh, utilizing the talus as kind of a mortise um, to impact against, and then and then uh, have the reduction uh, established by using the talus. So that's kind of what we did uh, for that fragment, that smaller fragment. Uh, sometimes when they're small and pulverized and they have a lot of corticate um, fibrillation on the cartilage, I usually just extract and discard. And I believe that's what I did in this particular instance. And and so. One of the things that um, Dave was talking about earlier is is like that piece can spit out um, if the sequence isn't quite right. So do you think you could take us through this? Sorry, I'm just answering a question here. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, well, I'll, so, can I ask a question of you, Brad? So go back a couple slides. We You started out with a slide that showed the, um, no, you go uh, forward one. So uh, although that they both show it. The, you showed an image of the posterior ligamentous structures as a really wide band of oh, tissue yeah. that went all the way from the fibula all the way over to the you know uh, medial side of the ankle. And in fact, in that in this case, you can see on that right hand image, the red is um, uh, illustrates the soft tissue structures, the broad insertion of the posterior 
if your tibia fibular ligament structures, and then you can see it superimposed there the, the the two fracture fragments of the posterior, the posterior and posterior fracture fragments, and the the image that you showed, the cartoon that you showed, sort of showed them booking those two open and then looking inside the book, tamping things down and and then folding them down. How does that work with the ligamentous uh, anatomy here? Are we just sacrificing those most yeah. medial extent of the soft tissues or? I, I think you are. And I think that you forego that additional ligamentous stability by way of an actual implant for the poster medial fragment from the poster lateral fragment. I think that the ligamentous connections, the ones that provide intrinsic syndesmotic stability are still intact and still attach to that, that, the lateral most corner of the, the, of that, of that fragment. And so to, yeah. to that point, when you're dissecting, it's really critical that one does not incise the lateral border of the, of the, um, yeah, the lateral border of the posterior malleolar fragment, because, or else you, you will be essentially deep, uh, injuring the syndesmotic ligaments and by restoring the piece back to its position, you're not going to retention the ligaments and you're not going to create stability. It's funny because we yeah, used to I think, used to th periosteum, right? think it was periosteum. Yes, yeah. I was just going to say. I used oh, to man. think I was I just taking out periosteum. Ah, fine. I'm just taking out some periosteum. Um, and, and I guess to some degree, maybe that, that, but, but it is part of the ligament, right? And I, but I agree with you, Fred, the, the majority, the density of that thing is still on that intact poster lateral segment, which speaks to though, how gentle you have to treat that fragment, right? I mean, you can't, one of the questions was, do you follow the fracture line all the way into the incisura to make sure that that part of the fracture line is perfect? And I worry that if you do that, you're actually taking down some of the ligamentous attachments to that fragment. And so I don't do that. I just simply reduce it using the sort of more cranial parts of that posterior fragments and the more medial parts of the cortical reduction to make sure that they're in the proper position. But I don't chase the incisura. I don't know about you guys. It's almost impossible to see that from the posterior lateral side, right? If you're going to, if you have a fracture that kind of goes into the mid coronal plane, you have to, for me at least, you have to do that from the front. And so that may change the position again to a lateral a position where I can um, see anteriorly in the incensura. And, you know, obviously you have to take down some of the ligamentous anteriorly, but that, you know, that becomes more of an articular injury in that area. But it's almost impossible from the posterior lateral side, at least for me, to see that area. You know, the fortunate thing about these posterior malleolar fractures is that they are very asymmetric and um, they usually key in only one way uh, because of the asymmetry. And because it's over such a large area of the posterior malleolus, you, if you get the majority of what you can see of the cortical reads intact, uh, like reduced, then chances are everything else by way of, of that reduction is going to be reduced as well. Yeah, I mean... Um... Dave, you mentioned the acetabulum, right? So we would sometimes see the posterior wall have some marginal impaction on it itself, and you have to sort of disimpact that joint, that part of the joint surface. Do you guys see that in the posterior blade this commonly, or is it just typically kind of an independent impaction fragment? I usually see that in the medial malleolus fragment more than the posterior. I, I can't remember if I've ever seen that in the posterior malleolus fragment itself. Um, I which makes that. it easier for us, right? Like, because then we don't have to worry about that disimpacting that actual fragment. We can, we can believe that by reducing the cortical, uh, lines that that's an indirect and accurate reduction at the joint. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So continuing on. So, um, we were talking about the sequence of fixation <clears throat> of these, of these fragments. And uh, David said that you could potentially uh, have some reductions go awry if your sequencing is not quite uh, uh, proper. Uh, maybe you could explain a little bit more. This is from the Mason paper from 2019 that's uh, you know often quoted recently, at least. Uh, and you know it's something that probably we we all faced before this paper came out, but it kind of puts it to paper, if you will, just showing the sequence starting on the medial side and getting that accurately reduced. And then the lateral, conversely, if you reduce the lateral, you can see how that will, and sometimes these are overlaps. So the, the medial fragment will be 
superficial or or displaced, if you will, posterior to that posterior lateral fragment. So if you reduce that posterior lateral fragment first, it can be impossible or you can get an inaccurate reduction. So uh, that's it, just the schematic directly from the paper, just showing the sequence. And I think that speaks to the fact that we can't, as we just talked about the instant sura, right? So you're looking at probably, what, two thirds of that posterior lateral fragment, uh, cortical reads as we do other places. And so, you know, you're looking best you can in this situation, you only have maybe the proximal extent of that fracture. So this kind of, I think schematically makes a lot of sense and, and, uh, you know, something we do now. Yeah. I think it's quite elegant. And then, and then, uh, some sort of anti-glide fixation to, make sure there's no cranial migration, but also no rotational uh, displacement of these fractures either. And then this particular schematic shows some uh, extra um, subchondral uh, lag screws uh, to hold that in place. In my- this, in, So this, this is from, Brad, sorry to interrupt. This is, yeah, from the two, this is from the 2004 paper from Weber that you showed mm -hmm. with the back fragments. And, you know, this was, this is, a, I think, a paper that we kind of forget about because, you know, Mason, that that paper is from like 2019, I think. And so 15 years before Weber was describing this, and this is kind of fragment specific fixation, right? That um, really looks at that posterior medial fragment and the posterior lateral fragment as, as opposed to trying to put one maybe larger implant down the middle. And uh, for me, I, I try and buttress these fragments with plates as much as possible. Occasionally like shown in the schematic here, uh, I may use independent screws, but for me, when I see that impaction, again, using the plateau analogy, I'm thinking of rafting. And so uh, I think a lot of people and a lot of us have gone to T plates so you can get a, at least two or three screws kind of rafting that impaction and, and the multiple fragments. And you still may need a second plate, but at least you're getting some uh, more subchondral uh, screws to augment your fixation and stability which really speaks to the importance of positioning, right? I mean, this is just a really hard maneuver to try to do this with either, you know, external rotation of the leg, trying to go post-remedial or extreme internal rotation when you're in the supine position, trying to apply these fragment specific implants is a, is a real bear. And, and I'm not sure that you're really doing it accurately. So the prone position here, I think is for sure preferred. Yeah. And then in this particular instance, um, all the fractures were reduced simultaneously and then the implants went on. So that's how uh, at least um, we can get around that that problem with that extrusion of that postermedial piece. And then you can actually see, like, look at the vectors of the screws. Like you can see like the lateral plates, all the screws are lateral to medial and then the medial plate, they're medial to lateral. And that just illustrates that we utilize two different approaches in order to gain access to these two lesions in the posterior aspect of the, um, of the posterior malleolus. And then the fibula is repaired. And the issue is that there's no syndesmotic fixation, uh, even though it's a super syndesmotic fracture, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, not, once you restore that posterior inferior tib tibial fibular ligament, uh, in, in a good majority of patients, uh, the syndesmosis is stable. Now, it just, uh, you're still stressing it, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every, every single patient after these, this fixation occurs gets stressed. I find, I find actually that it's, it's a little bit more accurate if I stress it, if like, for example, this patient did not require a flip, but if I was to flip the patient and then, uh, work on the anterior colliculus of the medial malleolus, that's when I stress it, stress it. And that's when I can usually tell the syndesmosis is out a little bit better than prone, but that's just my, um, my experience. So, um, so this was basically just a, a, a kind of an archetypal fracture that can be repaired through posterior approach, anti-glide manner, or direct reduction, restore stability of syndesmosis. You don't have to worry about any syndesmotic fixation moving forward in this patient's recovery. Um, so what, I mean, we, we make the x-rays look good, but do we make any difference? So this is, um, so Dave's going to take us through some of the, some, some of how these patients do, uh, and he's, he's talked about the Malloy paper uh, in passing. He was going to go a little bit more in depth about it now. Yeah. So this was a paper from a few years ago from JBJS open access, uh, 2019 out of England. And they, uh, 
did this uh, study. They had um, about 60 patients, I believe, that they uh, followed it a year. They sent them, it was, I think, by either mail and or phone. So they ended up with 50 patients. And they can, the Roberts study there, as you can see, was their uh, previous study of a smaller cohort. So it's the same group that uh, used the classic less than 25% on x-ray of uh, as an indication for fixation. So if it was less than 25%, they didn't fix the poster malleolus. And then they went ahead and kind of developed this classification that we've talked about um, and really did uh, approach specific. So what we've talked about poster medial approach and those kind of extended uh, segmental poster malleolus. And you can see the difference. They've used this score as a, scoring system as a, as a functional outcome. And again, you know, there's limitations to this paper, but you can see a 20 point increase in their, their, uh, their functional outcome. So pretty substantial increase. And again, you could argue <coughs> different uh, volume of patients, you know, there's obviously retrospective bias and, and so forth, but really they showed using, um, you know, CT based uh, diagnosis and really going after uh, you know, approach specific fragments, uh, improved outcomes. And I think that, you know, the other thing is, you know, if you look at the explosion of literature on the poster malleolus in the last 10 years, it's crazy. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of interest in this and there's a few, there's more than just this study looking at functional outcome improvements with direct approach to the poster malleolus and fixation and uh, fragment specific fixation, dealing with impaction, dealing with free fragments, uh, and really, you know, taking it to the next level as opposed to using that historic 25% that was based on a small number of cases from, you know, the early 20th, mid 20th century. So to that because point, we got a lot of, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Brad. No, no, please go ahead, Matt. No, I was just, there's a bunch of questions um, that I that are coming up. They're all great. And I want to answer a couple of them live. So make your point, Brad, and then I can answer some of these. Well, I was going to ask if there is ever a time where size is an important determinant factor of what you do. Or does that, all of these get fixed? Well, that was one of the, one, one of the questions um, that has come up. So if you have a decent size lateral malleolus, a decent size medium malleolus that has all of the deltoid ligament on it, and you have just a thin rim of the poster malleolus that you see on plain films and CT, are you guys fixing every one of those poster malleoli? I can tell you what I do, but what about you, Dave? I, I do not. If it's a real peripheral uh, posterior shell, like a posterior lateral shell, then I'm concentrating more. And, you know, because one, uh, you know, I'm not sure... I can get any fixation into that too. It changes the approach perhaps. And so an older person, they may not tolerate that uh, either posterior medial or posterior lateral approach. And three, I may be better at doing an open reduction of the syndesmosis and getting fixation that way once I've restored length alignment rotation of the fibula. So a very small, if you want to call it a shell or peripheral fragment, uh, then I'm not fixing. Now, conversely, if there's, intraarticular debris, then that might be a gateway to that intraarticular debris, even with a shell. And, or you can work through, if you have the right fibula fracture, the right at the level of the joint, sometimes you can work right through the fracture and get that debris out. So you don't have to necessarily go after that posterior lateral fragment. So, you know, just to answer your question in summary, for a very small peripheral shell, I'm not usually fixing it. How about you, Brad? Uh, I, 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 it's exactly the same answer uh, that I would give. Uh, usually, these peripheral rim fractures, we tend to see them in the more, the more of the geriatric population. Uh, they're comminuted. I worry that although we could potentially secure the poster malleolus back into place, um, the bone, the durability of that fixation may not be um, predictable uh, because of the quality of the bone itself. And so, for those patients. Uh, I've been I've been doing as Dave said. Uh, you can reduce the synosmosis through a more anteriorly based approach, and then uh, perform whatever uh, fixation strategy you feel comfortable in terms of transsynosmotic fixation. Yeah, I mean the answer I gave in the chat was I'll fix the lateral side and fix the medial side, and then I'll stress the ankle. And if the ankle's stable, which it 
which it commonly is, then I don't do anything. If the ankle still shows subluxation, then I'll fix the posterior in those cases. And that will, in most cases, stabilize the syndesmosis. If it doesn't, then I do what you said and go to the front and reduce, do an open reduction of the syndesmosis and use brand syndesmonic fixation. Um, Brad, are there any fractures? Yeah, go ahead, Dave. No, sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just going to say occasionally, you know, you have that kind of injury and it's an older person, maybe they have uh, comorbidities, uh, specifically diabetes, and you're at it, you're trying to get added fixation. Maybe, you know, obviously some cases you're using a locking plate, but you know, if I'm on the fence, sometimes I'll just do the quadricortical fixation to get added fixation, uh, knowing that, you know, there's potential problems with that, but you know, if it's on the fence, I'm not sure, then it's going to be a, a two, two level kind of benefit. One, you're going to stabilize, maybe you're not stressing the syndesmosis enough. And secondly, fixation montage for your stability yeah. for these patients. That, that gets into just like geriatric ankles, right? Like sometimes yeah. they just need quadricortical screws because the purchase is so poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what about, I think we answered this, um, but but maybe not well enough. What fractures are best suited for percutaneous fixation rather than direct open reduction? Hmm. Hmm. I can answer that one. Um, the ones that I'm thinking about, and it's not even a percutaneous approach, I'm still doing a, a direct approach down to bone because usually I'm putting that screw in anterolaterally. So I want to avoid damage to the superficial perineal nerve. So I'll, I won't make a large incision, but large enough to get retractors and then go right down to bone. The situation where you have an extension of a tibial, a distal tibial spiral fracture into the postromaleolus, and it's minimally maybe gapped open one millimeter or two, and it's undisplaced. And those are the ones that uh, I still generally put a clamp on it, uh, but those are the ones I'm thinking anterior to posterior fixation. If you want to use the term percutaneous, then fine. But those are the only ones. If I think that the posterior malleolus needs fixation, I'm doing a direct approach in the vast majority, if not all. Yeah, I'm always uh, humbled by how often we find incarcerated soft tissue and fracture lines that you thought were not that displaced. And, and then you pull out the piece of periosteum in the 22 year old and you're like, wow, I'm glad, I'm glad we opened the medial malleolus because you know, this could have been a, this could have been trouble. So for those reasons, um, uh, I usually don't do percutaneous fixation just because I don't trust the quality of the reduction. Um, but to Dave's point, yes, like the non-displaced posterior malleolus, that's going to get a tibial nail. That's, um, that, that can get percutaneous screws. I think the other thing, you know, it's been talked about in the pilon with incarceration of the, uh, posterior tibial tendon. I think you can get that. I've seen it at least once before where you can get partial incarceration with that extended posterior medial fragment of the posterior malleolus. So it's something to look at on the soft tissue windows. I don't think it happens as often as a pilon, but it can still happen for sure. And that again, may change your approach to a more, uh, the medial posterior medial approach, which is just off the posterior medial corner of the tibia to get access to that area. Yeah, I, I wish that I knew that you were going to say that, Dave. I have, uh, for some reason, it's a picture of uh, of a repaired uh, poster malleolus, and then there's a little hole. It's a little circle, right, where the tendon is going inside the bone because it was just incarcerated, and they fixed it around. So, yeah, to that point. Sometimes it just uh, takes a little elevator to flip it out of the way, right? You can just kind of disimpact it. Uh, Matt, this is going to be you. So um, this is your, take it away. Sure. Yeah. I think this is an interesting case that sort of um, highlights a couple challenges that uh, we face and that um, uh, is a, is kind of a nice way to, to manage uh, those, those specific challenges. So there's a 30 year old uh, woman who fell on the ice um, who has um, this injury. Um, Brad, what do you think? This is sort of similar to the first one you showed. Anything uh, yeah, here that worries you? Well, there. Well, I mean, of course, there's instability. Uh, a typical supination, external rotation, obliquity fracture. What I see is actually that flange of bone coming down the medial aspect of the fibular diaphysis that kind of flares into the incisura. That that is usually a pretty promising sign that potentially the anterior portion of the syndesmosis is going to be intact. 
Um, and if in conjunction with a poster malleolus, once you repair that, then, then likely that's you're very predictably going to restore the stability of the ankle and not need any sinus modification. That's kind of what I think like, to your point uh, about the, um, the, Underestimating the fracture lines with a plain radiograph, of course, this patient, I would get a CT scan, um, bilateral if we have them, um, uh, and uh, and then kind of go with the plan based on the CT scan. Can I make a couple of comments? Uh, one, Please. I think there's point loading on the talus, so I think it's important to get this reduced uh, on a timely basis. Um, and secondly, if you look at the, the uh, middle view, uh, you can see that cortical density on the poster malleolus that really kind of tells you that this is a more medial based poster malleolus and it may be segmental or, or poster lateral, poster medial. So you look for that kind of sign, that cortical density of the poster malleolus giving you a guide that, you know, this may be one that's not going to be so nice to approach from a poster lateral side, the poster lateral side. It's, uh, can you point to that, Brad? I don't have the pointer, can you, but can I you think what this? he's outlining is that large sort of extra white density that goes all the way across. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. I see. We're asking people that can't answer, but I can see it. <laughs> um, and I, <laughs> can you, okay. um, but yeah, that's it, right? That, that big, can you, can broad, you see white, extra dense um, piece of bone. Um, I don't, I didn't include the CT in this case, but it, but it actually was one large piece. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but it, there you go. Yeah. You can, you, you've shown it pretty, pretty well. And, and that to me, you know, these days for sure would, as Brad said, um, require a, a CT scan to further, further evaluate it. Yeah. Go ahead to the next slide. Yep. Here we go. There it is. There's the CT scan. So we do have it. Um, and, and boy, you can really see that point loading um, that um, DS was talking about on the talus that, um, I mean, that that part of the talus is pretty, pretty unhappy. Um, any, any of this worry you, Brad, about the reduction? Is this going to be easy, hard, or what's the, what's your, what's your positioning for this? And how are you going to, how are you going to manage it? Um. I think the reduction will be pretty straightforward. It's a matter of what you're going to yeah. do with that osteochondral fragment. If you throw it away, then it will be very straightforward. If it's if you're going to try to manipulate it in a place, that's going to take more finesse. Um, the fracture exits, at least on this lateral radiograph, a little low. So um, and it's so that plate that you're going to apply as a buttress may not necessarily have a lot of distal extension. So you may mm -hmm. want to either contemplate putting an independent screw, like in a subchondral manner, in order to compress the joint after you put the piece back into place or taking the plate and actually kind of putting it across that inflection point um, to the very distal poster malleolus. And then naturally you'd have to shoot screws in with the radiograph so that you're not in the joint. The fibula- I think for this for you. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, David. Oh, so this is kind of that situation that I was alluding to um, well, it was the last case, but you can see that it's almost like a window right into that, uh, on the axial view on the, on the right-hand side, it's a window into that articular fragment. So, uh, you know, it gives you access that you may not have from a posterior lateral side. And if I think I'm going to have, if I have any inclination that I may maintain or, or keep that fragment and try and put it back into position, then this would be a situation that I would do a posterior medial approach. Cause I just cannot, I, you know, you can see it from the posterior lateral side. And usually if I say there wasn't impaction here, I'm doing this lateral on a bean bag because then I can deflate the bean bag and get at the medial side and I can still see anteriorly. So for example, if they have a chaput fragment an anterior lateral fragment on the tibia or a wag staff on the fibula, then prone, it's virtually impossible to see that. Whereas in a lateral position, you, most people have enough external rotation. You can, you can get access anteriorly. So for this case, if I think that, you know, this patient's young and I think that fragment's big enough and I may want to save it, then I'm thinking a posterior medial approach that I can flip that posterior lateral uh, fragment, the posterior malleolus fragment out of the way and restore that back into position. And that's something Are that- Are there things that you use to judge that, DS? Is that like, can you look at the CT and say, yeah, I'm definitely going to try to save that uh, or no, I'm going to just pluck uh, it or how do you- 
decide. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough, right? And so you have to scrutinize the the two Ds and and put that in the context of the patient. Uh, and the other thing that, in much like I guess the electron analogy, if you take that fragment out, you got to be careful you don't squeeze that down because you can change the architecture of the ankle joint. You know, just like in the electron, on, you can make a V out of a semicircle. And so this I've done and asked, you know, I've done that many times, <laughs> probably too many times. Uh, where you kind of you're happy with the purchase and you're just cranking look at that purchase and and then lo and behold that plate is so powerful that it'll just push that and close that defect down so every I time that, I do it every time I I was like I just did it last week and I just did it. I, I do it like because you're just like I want to get this so good and sweet uh, and tight yeah. and you just drive it through and it because well, you don't, don't want to leave a right. gap right and so <laughs> paradoxically so I, but the answer, I, don't, I don't know but it's something you struggle with you know and I think it goes into the equation, you know, is it a 20 year old or a 60 plus year old? Um, and so, you know, I, I used to try to fix all, all of them. I used to, but I, I used to try to fix every single one of them. And then a paper came out and talked about gaps and congruity. And it made a point of those with um, congruous joints, but gaps did just as well as those people that were that were right that were that were without gaps those with step offs did poorly um, and Asian so it, scandinavian yeah yeah it's a small it's like a 31 patient paper but but it was still meaningful and it, and it to me it's still you know uh, it's still important if you can to get the joint perfect but if you're really struggling um, and doing three different approaches to try to tamp this one millimeter two millimeter sliver of joint surface i think it's sometimes it's just better to take it out yeah, and also um, pretty peripheral on the joint surface too, right? It's it's right. Yeah. fairly close here, so. Yeah, exactly. Brad, why don't you go to the next slide? I think it, okay. the next slides just can show I, kind of. Can what... I ask a question while you're while we're going yeah, to the yeah. next slide? Do, do, do you ever fix? Do you ever do this reduction through the fibular fracture? I, I was always told to do that. Just yeah, just go distract the fibular fracture and look at the joint and. And I've tried that and I've always had a lot of challenges in terms of my visualization and my ability to manipulate the fragments. Do you, do you, do you have any commentary on that? Well, yeah, that I mean, you, you, yeah, uh, I mean, you can, you can, uh, you, you can try to do that, but you can't see it well, Brad. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not an easy thing. You can see the, the cancellous part of it. That's what this right-hand images show is us using a uh, distraction through the fibula. We're working through the fibula to just capture that piece of joint that is ob obstructing the reduction of the post and bleedless. And so again, um, just a sort of a trick, if you get the CT scan and you see that um, continuity between the fibula fracture and the post and bleedless, which happens very commonly, um, you can clean out that post and bleedless fracture through the fibular fracture before the fibular fracture is fixed, obviously. But seeing the reduction of the post malleus through the fibular fracture, I think is super challenging. You might be able to see when it's displaced, the superior part, you know, the dimensions of the post malleus, you know, where it exits proximally. You might be able to see right there where the incisura is, but you can't really reduce it because then the fibula closes as well and, and you're not able to, to, to see anymore. So I don't know if you have the same experience, Dave. Yeah, for sure, for sure, absolutely. I, you know, it's, it's, again, it's a little trick just to more debridement. And then, like I said, in a, in a, in a lateral position, then you can do your posterior lateral approach to get fixation. Cause it's really hard to see that, um, you know, you're elevating the posterior fragment, the posterior malleolus fragment and trying to work through it and you can do it, but it's not, it's not that fun. Okay. So we've got that, we, we plucked that pesky piece of joint that is going to prevent our post malleus reduction um what brad are you is there a specific order that you do for these every time um is there a reason that you do it that the implants play a role what, what is the what is your strategy here um the strategy for me would be to reduce things provisionally simultaneously before any implants go on and uh -huh. some some uh, authors suggest repairing the fibula will help reduce, quote unquote, reduce the posterior malleolus into a more appropriate position. And to some extent, that's true. But the posterior malleolus needs to be anatomic and accurate, and that's on an order of millimeters. And I think that you really just need to do a direct posterior approach and look at the cortical exit points and then reduce the fracture and then hold it in place. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's what I'm thinking. Um, 
I usually start on the medial side and then build to the lateral side onto that uh, and then put on implants. How about you, Dave? You do anything different? Uh, no, not really. I think that, you know, it's still, the fibula is still the driver for me for, you know, the length alignment rotation. Uh, and so I may temporize with K-wires. Um, if I'm putting a poster plate on, uh, poster lateral plate, which generally that's the vast majority of these cases, um, I, I still am able to see the poster malleolus. The criticism always is if you put hardware in the, in the fibula, then you can't see the articular surface. And that's true to a certain extent. You can do obliques for sure. And that's true for a lateral plate. So if you're putting a lateral plate on, uh, for sure, you can't see. So I, I think that, you, you know, you still need, for me, I still like to get the fibula temporized at least uh, out to length because uh, the cases, uh, particularly a smaller peripheral poster malleolus like this, I, if I don't have the fibula stabilized, it's a real fun fight. Everything's moving all over the place. Yeah, I find it hard to drag the foot around, which is what you're doing when you try to fix the poster malleolus first if the yeah. poster malleolus is real small, <laughs> right? You're trying to, because you're you're literally dragging the whole foot by the poster malleolus attachments through the PITFL to the distal fibula, to the talus, to the rest of the foot. And so for me, um, actually fixing the fibula helps, I think first, but um, you can go to the next slide, Brad, and, and um, fixing it as you guys suggested with some preliminary fixation that is not gonna interfere with the visualization on the lateral view. So in this case, just a couple miniature fragment lag screws that I can still look at the judge, judge the reduction of the potion And in the, in the interest of time, I'll just sort of get through this and demonstrate what you described earlier, David, which was to get really excited about putting in that buttress screw before stabilizing the joint itself. And so this is what happens when you don't stabilize the articular surface before applying a good buttress plate. It actually works so well that it squeezes that postably in the segment out between the anterior part of the tibia and the plate and creates what I have termed the pumpkin seed effect. But you can imagine how it pushes the whole talus anteriorly and obviously creates a non-congruent joint. And so going to the next slide, you can just see that we recognize that because we didn't apply a plate on the posterior aspect of the fibula. Um, I probably wouldn't have seen that malreduction had I had a plate on the posterior lateral aspect of the fibula. Um, and so we can complete the fixation now um, appropriately with plates on both the posterior lateral portion of the tibia in the fixing the posterior malleolus and then neutralizing that fibula reduction with a posterior lateral plate. So you can just show the final stress images that show as you predicted, um, Brad, no syndesmotic instability simply because the post malleus was accurately reduced, restoring the PITFL. Nice. nice. Can you go back to the pumpkin seed effect slide? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think historically, and maybe some people still think that, you know, it's just a, you just need an anti glide or a buttress plate. You don't have to put any screws in the fragment. And, do you think that sometimes if you leave that plate more proximal and you go to push it, you're actually pushing that fragment, uh, not only squeezing it, but you're also pushing it distally. Obviously you're distally, saying that. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's still an articular fragment. And so I still want to get screws into that fragment at least, no question. at least one, if not two. And, and I think maybe that's, you know, the role of the, the T plate, if you want to call it that getting added fixation for stability. So I think historically, a lot of people wouldn't even put screws into that fragment just thinking that it's, and I think if it's small enough, yeah, for sure. But this larger fragment, for me at least, I, I'm trying to get screws in that. Uh, we'll go on to the next case. Um, Dave? Sure. This is a, a person who I just saw back today, actually, in follow up, who I treated a, about a year ago. Uh, she fell on ice. Uh, she's otherwise healthy. And this is her injury film. And, you know, I think if you have the opportunity of having those films, obviously you never want to get an x-ray like this. You try and get that ankle reduced. Um, but it really demonstrates a fairly significant energy, uh, posterior lateral, or at least a posterior dislocation. And these are the ones 
for me, um, you know, some thoughts go through my mind, Matt, anything thinking when you, yeah, this, this? yeah, this just makes me unhappy. Right. I mean, it's, um, it's, I could just imagine the cartilage scuffing off the talus, um, and, uh, the impaction that's happening at that level. Um, and so, um, uh, obviously a prompt reduction, uh, is important, but, um, this not only involves the, uh, the, obviously the, the fibula in sort of a long oblique way, quite distantly actually, um, but also marginal impaction of the joint surface. It's really, to me, more of a posterior pilon, um, that also happens to occlude the medial So people will call this an ankle fracture but it really doesn't fit into any of the classic categorizations that we have, right? It's not a Loggy Hansen, um, you know, SER4. Um, this is really a, a, a poster pilum. Uh, and I think that and the the sort of uh, classification schemes um, for Mason Malloy, whichever one you want to choose, will will likely um, call it that. Do, do you agree? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, you know, it's it's really that transition just like a supination adduction, if you want to use that term, that vertical medial malleolus of impaction, you know, it's really a transition to a pilon. And obviously it's a B-type pilon, but it's still, you know, got some significant joints. Yes, sometimes those are the worst. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. All right. Um, so yeah, she had a closed reduction and I think pretty decent. And, you know, for me, you know, I think historically people would say, well, that's a, that's probably a trimalleolar fracture, but the posterior malleolus is very small. So we're going to do this supine with a bump and do a posterior lateral or a lateral approach to the fibula and then do a small approach to the medial malleolus and everything's great. But I think that, you know, for me, the, the information that I get from a CT scan is so much more powerful and, and really guides my management. So if you just go ahead, I think this is yeah, the, the video, and this is similar to the case that was shown, but I think the fragment is quite a bit bigger. And there's also annoyingly enough, a fragment, a cortical fragment anteriorly. Oops. Um... So you can see that kind of posterior medial, posterior lateral combination, plus an anterior colliculus. And there's that little cortical fragment that's sitting in the ankle joint. And then the, uh, oblique fracture of the distal fibula. And it's not just a free fragment. There's also associated impaction, I think, as well um, on the anterior side, if you will, of the, you can see it there of the posterior malleolus. And then there's just a, I think there's just a coronal, yeah. Yeah, that poster medial impaction is just going to be a bear. Yeah. What do you think, Brad? When you, when you see this, so that that what that makes me when I so when I see, uh, <clears throat> see that yeah, let's see right stop. there stop <laughs> stop <laughs> that so like right there so when you disengage that fragment you are not gonna you're gonna have a compressed bone bed that you're gonna to have to essentially put that articular fragment back into space and then bone graft behind. That's what I think when I see that. And, and, I, and I'm like, oh my God, that's gonna be like really, really hard. What about approach and position? Um, uh, I have to go to the axial again, but based upon what I've seen, uh, likely the posterior approach through a prone, prone position and um, beginning on the lateral side, but this, this we'd, we'd probably open the medial side simultaneously and then work through two windows um, in order to um, affect the reduction. Matt? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Sorry, I was answering a question. Um, for me, um, absolutely prone. And again, um, uh, I'd start on the post medial side and see how much I could get through that. Um, but I'm going to have to go post lateral as well to at least address the fibula and I'll move over an interval if I need to. What do you do with the anterior colliculus? Do you try and flex up the knee and work upside down and kind of do it? I actually took a picture of that this past week and I don't have it with me, but I took a photograph of me trying to do that, Dan. It is the worst. It's the worst thing. 
in the world. And it is so worth uh, what I think you do. And I think maybe Brad does. I know a lot of folks do is to just take the time to just flip the patient over once you've fixed all of the posterior and lateral structures and just do it like you normally do it. You can do it. You can just flex the knee up. You can expose the medium malleolus and you can reduce it, but it is really just, um, it is more of a struggle and uh, more uncomfortable than it's worth for me. It, it Sometimes people have enough rotation in their hip that they, you can, and you can airplane the bed a little bit that you can rotate the leg and kind of fiddle around that way, but it's never really that satisfying. You know, so, all right, we'll just for the sake of time, we'll just keep going. So uh, I think the next slide has the, so that's just static views, just putting it all together. So it's, if you want to use the Mason class, that's a pretty classic 2B, I think. And it's a post medial or lateral fragment and uh, impaction on the medial side. The thing that for me, the decision-making here is that fragment goes medially, goes pretty mid-coronal. So are you going to make the so-called medial, post-remedial approach, which is off the post-remedial border or the class or the more if you will, posterior approach beside the Achilles tendon. And, and so I struggled a bit with that, this trying to figure out. And then if you look as it comes more proximal, is it is that gonna need a kind of almost a coronal plate uh, on the medial side to buttress it? And so I, and there has been occasions where I've put three plates on the, you know, one more medial, one more posterior medial and one more posterior lateral, but that's kind of crazy. So, you know, this is kind of a little difficult for me, but ultimately I said, I set on a posterior medial approach, which is just beside the Achilles tendon working through FHL in a prone position and, and uh, a combined posterior lateral at the same time. So get the posterior lateral kind of temporized and then <clears throat> posterior medial side. And then I uh, couldn't see that. You'll see in that, in that coronal, just on the center at the bottom there, is that anterior colliculus and I just couldn't see it. So we ended up flipping her over supine and doing a, a second approach, more anteromedial for a single screw. So this just, just uh, reiterates what I just said, just the plan was prone initially. And then. Did, so do you think that, um, can you just work from, um, uh, even in the poster medial um, exposure, I feel like I can go from, you know, FHL bundle interval to over to the, you know, bundle between, between the bundle and F, you know, FDL and even over to the, even as far over as the, as the tip post um, through that same incision, if I just make it long enough, is that, is that not the case for you? Like, do you really sure. focus on where the actual incision is? Um, Cause I don't really fret about that all that much when I look, when I do that. Yeah. It's just, it's just a matter. I find it you sometimes have to, if you do put that medial, poster medial kind of mid coronal plate on for a vertical medial mal, you have to almost do the screws percutaneous, you know, like you, you're able to get the plate slid up, you're able to get the reduction, but the angle on the screws is pretty difficult. And so I have a couple of times just put them in through small, like a, just a percutaneous approach, which is a pain in the butt, but you can do it. And it's almost, you got to twist the plate. So it's a little two millimeter plate usually, and you just got to twist the plate because it starts kind of posture distal and then swings around proximal medial. Yeah, so, sometimes these um, some uh, these posterior medial fragments, like they involve like the, the, the gliding surface of the TID post. And so like you can see this, like in that center image with the impacted fragment, like that posterior medial fragment, like that, like a good broad surface of it is actually articular or semi-articular cartilage for the tendon to glide on. So you can't put an implant there. So just something to think about when you're when you're planning your surgical approach and your, your surgical tactic. And sometimes you have to I'll put, confess. You know, I'll confess. I I I'll confess. I put implants into that into that gutter, not all the way down, but at the apex, you know, where it exits, which usually isn't in the articular area. And I'll try to make them as low profile and smooth as I can. But I, I, if I need to put it there, I need to go there. Like that's just that. I'm sorry. It just has to go. Yeah, so we uh, we didn't really talk about the articular fragment. So the there was some impaction you can see on the right side that kind of impaction uh, uh, just on the more intact tibial side that was annoying uh, from my recollection. I think that just ended up getting removed. The major fragment I was able to put back and held with a couple of one point two five or one one wires as a temporization, and then 
closed the the book down and and uh, took the wires out. And so this was one where we used a two four T plate. Uh, you can see there, and and uh, the length of that plate varies. It can be longer as needed, and then more lateral uh, based two millimeter plate. We didn't end up going more medial. It kind of stabilized, and then. Um, and that's, you can see that plate's a little more distal than I normally uh, put that on the fibula for sure. That's probably going to, it's not bothering her right now at a year. And then uh, you can see the single fragment on the medium malleolus. Dave, I, I see that you're using locking plates kind of in a buttress mode. Is that is that like typical for you? Is it what you is it harder you think than using non locking plates? I personally find it harder to contour that thicker locking plate in this situation uh, and prefer the others. Is that what do you this, what do you find? This is pretty low profile and it's pretty flexible. Um, so yeah, yeah, I still use cortical screws and occasionally yeah. once you get the plate down, like we do everywhere else, you know, once you get the plate down, you can if you don't get purchase, you can sub them out with the the locking screws so that's nice it's a combi kind of a combination between non-locking and locking poles so you have that opportunity to convert it if you need to to a, a locking screw yeah i like i like this this device because it's uh it's got locking fixation and it's the cluster um you know the bone sometimes is not always the best down there you have more, more than one point of fixation which sometimes in short segments with a tubular plate, you're only going to get one point of fixation, um, and then um, it, it just it's just uh, I, I just this is kind of like my go-to. Oh, sorry, Matt, you were talking about the lateral malleolus. I was talking about the posterior malleolus. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You have to certainly make sure the plate's down to bone, obviously. And so, um, you know, I put a put a clamp on uh, pressure on the plates just as that first screw is going down or the end or the second screw as well. Those, those are incisions there that it's kind of an oblique poster medial, but, um, and you can see the more anterior approach. Safe, Thank didn't you. necrose between the two? No, I mean, I think that yeah. we know that vertical incisions are tolerated pretty well and you know I'm, I'm not sure i would and i have done this in the older population but you gotta you gotta be a little careful on the older population for this for sure well and it, and it all depends on what you do underneath the skin right it's not it's not spreading and creating a, a degloving in between those two exposures you're you're going straight down to where you need to see and, and not not creating a, a you know a, a a soft tissue bridge underneath there. So that's why it did so well, of course. Yeah. All right, uh, we're on great time. Uh, so this is uh, the last case we'll discuss and it's a little of a of an atypical thing. Um, and it's that kind of like what happens when our plans don't go out uh, the way that we expected. So 45 year old, uh, he's like the chief of the fire department in one of our towns nearby. He got in a motorcycle accident and he presents with this uh, so Matt, anything kind of out of the ordinary for this? Um, Aside from, you know, look, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, when I look at these images, um, I'm always struck <laughs> by some, the, the different morphologies of people's incisuras, right? So this one to me looks like one that's pretty shallow and straight because I, at least on one view, don't see any tibia and fibula overlap, which suggests that's abnormal. So everyone should have some, even even a micron of overlap. I don't see that there. So it makes me think that there's an injury in that area, of course. And um, and when I look critically at the AP X-ray, I can see almost two little mountainous. It look all, actually looks my, like my initial, there's an M there. Um, that looks like there's not just a poster lateral, but also probably a poster medial um, malleolus fracture uh, that you can then appreciate more on the on the lateral view, um, and then like we were talking about before this, which was kind of this funny um, thing that we see with a lot of these injuries, and th and that is it's almost always a very small anterior colliculus fracture um, uh, associated with these you know more significantly sized um, posterior malleolus fractures. 
And I and I guess you know I will say that the the other thing that's a little bit unique is that I don't see a fibula that's injured, so no fibula fracture here. At least on these images, I'd certainly like to get full length films to make sure that there's not something higher up. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I'm a bad resident. I didn't get all the X-rays, but there were no, there was no problem. <clears throat> so here's our CAT scan. Anything kind of pop out to you? Anything out of the ordinary? It looks like kind of the archetypal fracture diagram that we just saw in that Mason Malloy paper. So intact fibula, but asymmetry in the insensura. So this is again, like I alluded to, this is a real nice one for bilateral ankle CTs. Just yeah, this is where you want that other CT of the other side, right? I mean, it's obvious that it's for me asymmetric. So that anterior ligaments, uh, the distal tib fib ligaments blown. So this is one so year that you know you may need augmentation of the synismosis as far as fixation. So yeah, to that point, uh, that's more or less what happened. This is kind of neat about how like the fragment gets removed. You can see that little die punch that's uh, kind of removed. That's that little intercalary fragment, but we maintain the overall radius of curvature of the poster more or less. Uh, I don't think, I, in my opinion, I don't think patients really appreciate that cortical defect or that cartilage defect that, that, that greatly. <clears throat> Um, so we go ahead and repair it, and uh, this is kind of our construct utilizing uh, um, uh, buttress plating here. And this is kind of Matt. This is how I kind of duck around the posterior tib tendon uh, in groove. I kind of just get the most cranial extent of the yeah of the, because um, you exited the so high. Yeah. Yeah. Totally get it. Yeah. And uh, and that that kind of worked for this person. But what happened is is we stressed the synosmosis. So let me ask you that: How do you folks stress synosmosis, and like what works for you? Like, how do you tell a synosmosis? Is yeah, asking? I mean, yeah, I mean, I just do it physiologically. Like to me, um, a Quigley maneuver is not physiologic. Um, there's, I, I I've never. being grabbed by a clamp and had their fibula feet rotate. And so, you know, for me, that's what it is. It's an external rotation stress examination with the foot in dorsiflexion and the proximal portion of the limb held fixed um, with, you know, um, you know, whatever. You can do dynamic imaging or you can just save an image in the plantar or in the dorsiflex position and then do dorsiflexion and external rotation. And, you know, I mean, you put it, the amount of stress that you think you need to, to detect the difference. Um. Oh, this pesky Zoom ribbon is always in the way. Okay, let me just move that. There we go. So in the operating room, uh, the way that I stress the uh, fibula is uh, I just essentially took the fibula and moved it kind of in an anterior posterior plane. Where's my camera here? It's like that. So like if the leg was like longitudinal like that, I moved the fibula up and down. And uh, this was kind of an interesting uh, paper that I learned from one of my AO friends um, who, who basically... Maybe we're assessing for synosmotic instability in maybe a, a less than optimal way, and maybe this might help un, uh, uncover in, uh, called in, instability a little bit better. So basically, we can translate the fibula anterior posterior, um, and then uh, and then like you said, we we fix the synosmosis uh, because the when you look at the CT scan to Dave's point, which you know he's so smart, he figured this out like in a, like a blink of an eye. You can see the anterior synosmosis is wide open. So just by retentioning the posterior soft tissues, by uh, repairing the posterior malleolus, we're going to have to anticipate some residual instability uh, that's assessed after fixation, and 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 obviously we we, we took care of that. So uh, the patient, uh, you know, two year follow up, he fractured his screws; they're a little bit loose, but uh, otherwise, you know, he's kind of uneventful. So, Brad, is your go-to for the larger is that's a quarter tubular plate with two seven screws? Is that kind of your go-to implant? You know, all, all things being equal, there's not a lot of impaction where you need to raft it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I use. Yeah, same, same. Yeah. I like the quarter tubular plate. You're talking about for the poster mail. Yeah, for the poster mail. I think for me also is I need to bend that plate around the as the poster mail as as I get more distal. You can see if you move that plate down just a smidge more, you're going to have to bend that plate around. And that's, uh, I tend to make that mistake from time to time where I don't contour it. I think the screw is going to do it, but the screw doesn't necessarily bring that around. So, yeah. yeah. 
I, I usually mm -hmm. stop this plate a little short and then uh, put a screw like caudal to it, like extra outside the plate and just kind of like as an independent screw. Uh, Subchondral bone usually is pretty good down there. It's funny how we do it different. I, I almost always pre-bend the very end of that plate with a with a bend that turns the corner um, yeah. so that it, it doesn't end up looking like that, just so that it's not sticking out. And I don't know if that matters or not, Red, but but I always put it down so that when the buttress goes on, it's already curving down onto the posterior. It doesn't seem to stick out into the soft tissues. I, I don't know if that makes a difference. I also um, take a but it make it flat. So instead of the kind of mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you so, how do you do that? You hit it with a mallet or hammer it. <laughs> there's a big there's a big plier in the set that I use that is big enough that it you can just take it and crimp it down and make it make it flat. Mm -hmm. I do that in the fibula too. If I use a one third tubular plate distally, I make it flat. So it's just a little less and it probably doesn't make one bit of difference to tell you the truth, but it makes me feel better. Okay. Well that kind of comes to the end of our uh discussion, our little virtual fireside. Um this was uh, some level of recommendation of evidence recommendations from um, Stefan Rommel, who did a, a review article on poster malaleus. Uh, it's from JBGS Reviews. Uh, take a look. It's it's pretty it's pretty it's a pretty comprehensive paper, and it's what's intriguing to us or to me at least is is that the recommendations of care, all of these different recommendations, we we touch base upon it, all of them, and so it it's, provides quite a powerful summary. So. CT scans are essential for detecting the three-dimensional anatomy of the fracture anatomy. I think we've heard that tonight. Uh, we talked about how um, we should consider operative management for posterior millimeter fractures with displacement uh, because of the articular nature or if there's intercalary fragments um, to reduce them. We discussed that the posterior malleolar fracture restores, by fixing that, it restores the integrity of the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament and significantly reduces the need for additional sinus <coughs> Um, We learned that um, open reduction and fixation, I skipped one, but open reduction and fixation of posterior malleolar fragments via uh, direct approaches is biomechanically more stable and provides a more accurate reduction than indirect reduction with anterior to posterior screw fixation. It's another very um, important thing that I think uh, we should impress upon our, our, our viewers. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, screw fixation of the posterior malleolus should precede intramedullary nailing. Uh, we kind of talked about that briefly with our percutaneous uh, discussion. And, um, and that's kind of the, the, the primary take home points that we wanted to tell you uh, this evening. Um, and then there was also one more um, little slide here. So um, for our part, posterior malleolus fixation, we know it's linked with improved patient outcome. Uh, because you're likely uh, restoring the stability and the patients are feeling that. Uh, posterior malleolar approaches, they can be done safely. So once one is armed with the knowledge and anatomy uh, and, and confidence and experience, then, then you can safely uh, approach the posterior malleolus through a multitude of different methods and uh, trajectories and safely be able to reduce the fracture and apply buttress implants. And then lastly, uh, it's important for you to address uh, residual, uh, assess and address residual instability because like that last case, just because we repair the posterior malleolus, there may be still some residual instability that needs to be addressed because if it's not, your patients are going to hurt and they're going to tell you. So with that, uh, that kind of concludes our uh, webinar. Do we have any Q&A questions that may we want to hit upon before we finish? So there's a, there are a couple um, that that um, there's a lot about the syndesmosis. So maybe we'll just table those for the for the moment. Um, I wanna ask you guys honestly, is this top line true for you? Maybe you're not studying it, but in your anecdotal experience, are those whose posterior malleolus fractures you fixed better? Um, uh, are they no different? Um, are, are you impressed by how much better they do? What, what's your, what's your What's your feeling other than just following the literature? Um, so I compare, so in answering this question, I compare my experience when I was a junior attending compared to when I am, where I am now, which is not junior, <laughs> older. <laughs> uh, 
And and when I as I got older, I started preparing um, the poster Malalas uh, with as much regularity as I do now. And I recall being a junior attending, having my patients not be entirely satisfied with what I thought were relatively straightforward injuries. Uh, you know, it wasn't a large posterior malleolus and they were hurting and I just didn't know like what's going on. And, and of course, at the time they were having residual instability that I wasn't appreciating. So, yes, I do think that my, these patients that we repair with posterior malleolus or trimalleolar ankle fractures, they do well. Like I, I usually can tell them with relative confidence that I think you're going to do pretty good. And I can't say that with all foot and ankle trauma that we take care of. Um, and I think that it's because we are providing so much stability via repairing the posterior malleolus. I, for uh, me, yeah. I, I think the baseline, as soon as you see a posterior malleolus, we know from the literature and, and probably everyone's experience, that's that's further down on the uh, uh, functional outcome. In other words, as soon as you see a posterior malleolus, that patient's going to have somewhat of an inferior outcome to a, a lateral malleolus in isolation. And we know that from sure. and, well, that's the first thing. And, and I think that it's an articular injury. If it's big enough, I think that there's impaction and free fragments that we know don't do well in other joints. So, and I think it's going to take time. It's going to, you know, the whole um, focus about postermalleolus fixation and dressing it, you know, we know that ankle arthritis can take a long time to develop an ankle fracture. So it's going to take probably 10 to 20 years before you know, we have longitudinal studies, hopefully we, someone's doing it uh, to see if we're going to make a big impact on these. But, uh, you know, you're you're correcting a joint incongruity. And we know if we have a practice where we see patients with incongruous poster malleolus that don't do well, and also in the short term, you know, you can see on the, on the couple of CTs that we had in these cases tonight, that talus is point loading and there's obviously the reason is the fibula as well, but you know, that area that's got impaction and, and free fragments, you know, that that's got to do better if we clean it out and, and reduce it. Yeah. All right. Very about, cool. Um, one more question. How about oh, yeah. um, weight bearing? So there's lots of literature that suggests that we can just walk all our ankle fractures um, nowadays. Um, do you, are you walking these people right away or do you have a different algorithm? Well, that's, we did that study, but that was by mouths. And so for me, this is an articular injury, especially if I'm, <clears throat> if I'm excising it, maybe that's a little different, the articular segment, but if I'm fixing that joint surface, restoring the free fragment, then, you know, I want to delay weight bearing for at least eight, if not 12 weeks. So that's not to say I don't go early range of motion. So I'll get the moving when the incisions healed in two weeks or less even, and I'll get the moving with a removal device, but I, I won't let them weight bear for at least two months. How about you guys? Do you find that they're any more, do you find that they're any more stiff David or Brad than those um, that you used to treat without fixation of the post -humilius? That is the additional dissection do you see complications like stiffness, hematoma, um, flexion contractures, things like that? And, and how do we avoid that? Yeah, so um, so um, I, I'm on 2% battery life, so I'm gonna, I have to plug in my computer <laughs> and change, if I change the resolution of the screen. So I apologize to all the folks, but you don't need to see the screen anymore. You just need to listen to us. Um, so I think that one of the reasons why people get a lot of stiffness is uh, because of the way the surgery is performed. And so what a lot of folks, uh, I think, or at least the way that I was originally introduced to the approach was, is you go through the post, the lateral compartment, and then you go through that. And then through the lateral compartment, you access the deposterior posterior compartment via the flexor hallucis longus. And so what you're doing is, is you're essentially doing like a small, like fasciotomy that creates confluence of two two opposing muscle units, uh, the lateral compartment and the deep posterior compartment, and they kind of glom together in that one location. And I think that creates stiffness. So the way that I've been doing this, and I don't, I don't have anything other than anecdotal, so please just take that, take this for what it's worth. Um, I actually make two fascial incisions. So I go directly over the FHL first uh, to get to the posterior lateral part of the ankle. And I, and I move like you do like an FCR approach for just the radius. And then I, and then whenever that's done, I close that fascia as its own independent unit. And then 
I find the perforators that herald the difference between the deep posterior and the lateral compartment, and I go anterior to that. And then so I make a fascial incision completely new in the lateral compartment. And so the two, that intermuscular septum has never been violated. You never got into the perineal vein, which bled and like bled like 30 cc's that forms like a big scar ball, all of those types of things. So, so I think that that actually has, um, has relevance, clinical relevance um, for these patients in terms of stiffness. Yeah, think, I agree. Man? I think he, hemostasis in that area is critical, right? And, and it isn't easy. I mean, you um, again, if you're trying to struggle supine, doing a posterior exposure, and you're trying to identify, protect, or even coagulate some of the perineal vessels, it's it's just hard to do. You, you can't see them well enough, and so it, if you're, uh, you know, especially if you're under tourniquet, you're not going to identify that. Um, I, I would encourage you that those of you that are doing this um that if you're using a tourniquet that's okay but if you are i would deflate the tourniquet before closure just to make sure that there's hemostasis there i've certainly seen in my own hands um hematomas um, and you know um, fibrosis of that deep posterior compartment uh, probably as a result of hematomas that have developed in that area that i didn't recognize so um you're right it is i think really important to do the surgery well um, because when it's done poorly, it, it can um, create additional potential additional problem. Sure. Any more questions, Matt? We're about yeah, we're right up against it. There's one more question, which I think is a decent question. Um, uh, and David, maybe you can answer this. It says sometimes on a good lateral reduction of the joint looks anatomic. So a good lateral of the talus is I assume what they're describing, but the oblique view shows that there's still a step off of the posterior medullus fracture, uh, even if the cortical reduction read has been good. Um, are you routinely getting oblique views to make sure the joint is anatomic or do you just judge that perfect lateral and that's it? No, I, I tend to get oblique views because that, I mean, it can be rotational and it can be translational as well. So I just did one last week. It was a redo actually for quite a number of hours. And, you know, the, it looked good on the, the lateral and then we did an oblique and it was off and it was translated, you know, probably two or three millimeters. And so you can have translation. And I find that's more common when I don't fix the, or at least stabilize the fibula, get it out to length initially because you're pulling like, yeah. You know, yeah. So you're trying to pull yeah. that malleolus over, but I think it's important to get oblique views. And I, I think there can be subtle rotational views, even because we don't have a complete 360 view of that posterior malleolus, right? We're depending on limited cortical reads and perhaps through a very narrow kind of tunnel view, if you will. And so I think it's important to get multiple views for sure. Yeah. The, the obliques don't lie. Um, the, you know, remember the plane of this fracture is oblique almost all the time. It's not perfectly in the lateral plane. So I totally agree with you. It's a good, great question. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're questions are completed and, and I guess we come to the end of the evening. So we appreciate your time and hopefully this was very informative. I certainly had a lot of fun. Um, and we hope to see you again on future webinars.